So now that I understand that this camera here can do has three different points of contact as to where you can use to zoom in. Mm -hmm. There's the ring, the top, and now the display. Mm -hmm. It may not be doing it because there's something at fault with your display on that area oh. where the zoom is. So now that it's upside down, it's no longer touching that area. Remember, I used to work at Apple for five years. Yes. And I never took advantage of that. <laughs> you should have. Yeah. In Honolulu and Hawaii, is it beginning to zoom in on you again? No, I, oh. I figure it would be a good time to look <laughs> since you're talking and this would be your cutaway. Oh, and I was like, oh, this is a no, good you know time what? to check. <laughs> you know what the cutaway is going to be? <laughs> you looking at the camera. I'm going to edit that. Wait, so <laughs> we were, you were talking about full circle. Yeah. So we have worked together for a long time at yeah. the other radio station. I had my own production room. You had your own mm -hmm. production room. And... You knew that I was a fan of The Office. Yes. So you put a camera on my wall. You printed up a camera. Do you remember this? You took a photo of a video camera and taped it to my wall above my desk oh so my that I could do this. <laughs> do you not remember that? I think I have a photo of it oh somewhere. Oh my God, that's funny. It was the best uh -huh. thing ever because I would do it all the time. When yeah. nobody's there, I'd just be working. And I'd just be like, oh, I forgot to do this. <laughs> just oh, look at the fourth that's so wall. Great. That is so <laughs> funny. There are too many ways to take this conversation. There's not a fork in the road. We are at the roundabout and we're going <laughs> around. I want to go back. Okay, so it was 2005 was your first paid professional musical gig you were hired mm -hmm. somebody said we want you to play bass yes bass play bass you were in radio before you got hired yep okay so who was the person who brought you into your first official radio station that was jeff corrales i want to say dj fly kid that's the one <laughs> that's him so he and i uh we went to farrington high school together Class of 03. It was the weekend I was catching the bus mm -hmm. to Sandy Beach with my bodyboard. I saw him at the, the bus stop at Kapalama mm -hmm. across from Kamehameha Shopping Center. I said, where are you going? He's like, I'm going to the radio station. I'm an intern there at this hip-hop station. Mm -hmm. And I said, cool. He goes, hey, the reggae station is looking for guys. You should come check it out. And I said, sure. So I went to the beach. That Monday, I came in and I met, I believe the first person that I met was um, JJ, John Ching. Mm. Or was it Roz McCullough? One of those oh, two. Oh, both would be really I good. think they yeah. were there at the same time. Mm -hmm. And Kamu Kanekoa. Mm. Those three were the first ones I met because they were the promotion side of uh, that cluster. Mm hmm I just talked to him. Said I was in high school. I'm in. I love music, mm -hmm. and that's what it was. So I started hanging out at the events, passing out prizes, and obviously the benefits of that was that I would get to go to the shows and all these things, which is super cool. Set up the banners, you know, and all that stuff. So I did that. Um, I think it was the end of the school year because I typically participate in a lot of sports during the off seasons or like in between seasons, I would go back for a little while mm -hmm. and it eventually um, transferred over to being in the studio with Eddie L. At that point, my mom found out that Alulike, uh, which is a nonprofit had some sort of grant that would pay you to intern for things. So this was during the summer. So that's how I kind of, ended up making money off of interning at the radio station. And then like most radio stations, the talent moves per shift. So they get go to a different station, go to a different shift, whatever the case. So I believe the first um, experience I had on air was with Eddie L. I was with him for a little while and then it went over to McCunny. They were both in the afternoon and then I went through a bunch of different guys. I made friends with John James, mm -hmm. who was uh, the production guy over at that cluster. And he... And Eddie really helped teach me how to do um, audio production. And those are two incredibly yes. gifted. Absolutely. 
And that's that's how um, I ended up getting hired to do that was help with production. That was as soon as I graduated high school. That's what um, Fred Rico hired me to do. And that's what I did. And then uh, shortly after that, I um, was asked to be the morning show producer for Lanai and Augie. Mm -hmm. So I did that for a little while. With that came a weekend shift, and then eventually I ended up doing a night shift at that particular station. I eventually ended up becoming the music director at one point, maybe seven or eight years. I got let go, and then I ended up here where we are now. Music. You got into radio broadcasting. Mm -hmm. Was it through the relationships of doing production that and people, I guess, were guests? I was playing, playing at home. I had, I had bought my own bass. I was super, super stoked about it and then learning. And then one of our, our friends who may be our cousin somehow, you know, the, the local way, I'm not sure what it is, uh, but he says, Hey, so-and-so them are across the Valley in Kalihi Valley. You should go check them out. So it took me one day to check out the, one of their rehearsals and then I got to jam with them and they asked me to play with them. And then I had met, DJ Odyssey, known now as Joseph Soul, mm -hmm. introduced me to some of his friends that he knew in the scene. And it was from there that I really began my career in the local music industry. Because the first band that I played was was more of like a garage band. They played out at, do you remember Bliss Nightclub? It was by Comp USA, I believe, in, uh, in Kaka'ako. I believe it's where Salt is now. It was like a reggae club, so it was just like more like an underground kind of thing. It wasn't a huge, you know, like these Waikiki shell shows that you would see them. More of the the roots reggae acts, which is which is cool because that's what a you know, growing up, uh, I just really wanted to make sure that I respected that music that I wanted to play, and man, so many things coming to my head right now. You mentioned about not knowing where to go, and I'm like, man, I'm. Re talking about this one thing and then I'm remembering something else mm -hmm. from a slightly earlier conversation we had. I'm like, I want to go back and correct that. And I'm like, wow, just thinking about it all, just kind of seeing how it all kind of comes into play. Speaking of like, just like reggae in general, is like, I just want to be really respectful of something that's not mine. Similar to how, you know, somebody dancing hula, you would like to see them have that same amount of respect for your culture, even though it, it's not there. It's, it's like, okay, I appreciate that you have gone through the lengths, you've done your homework. You're doing it with the highest regard towards what you're doing, not just like, ha ha, hooky lao, you know, kind of thing. That's the thing that I see. And I see that, you know, in in the music at the time. And I guess now, you know, there's a lot of interpretation, mm. which is tough because our influences become. It's an influence off of an interpretation off of an interpretation of what I guess purists or like uh people who know that particular genre you, you know what i'm saying traditionalists and, traditionalists and yeah. it's like well this isn't really reggae i was like yeah but it is mm -hmm. you know like you listen to our station and i would say that's a reggae station but if you were to dig deep and really learn about it it's like it has reggae influences mm -hmm. but is it reggae sure technically mm -hmm. but it's one of those sub genres you know, like anything else, you can kind of break it down. And like Hawaii is like a very R&B, R&B, reggae slash chalang-a-lang <laughs> influence, you know. That being said, uh, I was rolling in this scene, this uh, roots reggae scene, because, you know, these musicians had the utmost regard for for reggae music and they would study it and learn about it on their own. And, and I guess that's kind of one of the big reasons why I wanted to be a part of the radio now that I'm remembering it is I remember feeling like if you don't like what you hear, if you want something done about something, go fix it. So the only way to fix anything is from the inside. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like government, right? We can complain and we can go wave signs and walk down Waikiki all we want. But if you don't have somebody on the inside that's willing to to a uh, fight for you, nothing's going to happen. So, and that's where, you know, voting is a big thing. Mm -hmm. Get your vote in so that you can be a part of the solution. You can put whoever you feel 
uh, is able to speak for you mm-hmm. in that place. And I guess that's kind of where in my head, I'm like, well, if I don't like certain things that I'm hearing, which is the biggest complaint about pretty much every radio station, <laughs> you guys play the same songs over and over again all the yeah. time. And I aligned with that and I was like, yeah, they do. Mm-hmm. Well, how do we fix this? Why can't they be like this outer island station who mm-hmm. plays this songs I've never heard before and stuff like that? And, you know, just us being people who have nothing to do with this industry, mm-hmm. trying to dictate what somebody else should be doing doesn't make sense to me. It's like, well, if I strongly feel about feel this way about that, why don't I learn more about it, get in and see what I can do? Mm-hmm. And if I can't change anything, at least I can inform the people who have their concerns about what's actually going on rather than just being ignorant to what's anything that's happening and just blabbing and complaining about things that you have nothing to do with. I remember having these discussions, especially since I said I was catching the bus to Sandy Beach and that's where you catch the Maui radio stations. Mm -hmm. So you can really sit out there and just kind of hang out between sets and be like, what is this song? I have never heard it here. So as time went on, um, I start to realize something as you get into any industry, right? Mm -hmm. And this is a saying that I have been saying for, shoot, 15 plus years now. I was like, you know, the outer island stations play a lot more hits than we do. However, they also play a lot more misses. Deeper cuts. Yes. Album cuts. Um, yeah. Like, they do a lot more it, favors for their family. And anyway, I'm joking. Um, but <laughs> what I'm saying is like, I, I realize that Hawaii, uh, excuse me, Oahu specifically uh, treats their, I, I'm going to speak very um, specifically oh, okay. to our station, uh, High 93, mm. and the type of music that we play, Hawaiian reggae music. Um, in 2022. In 2022, well, throughout all the time that I've spent in radio is it we're basically a top 40 local station. And that's what you have to do in a market of this size in order to retain um, your listenership. And that's really what it came down to. And that's what I learned being the music director over there for, for, I don't know, it was like four or five years or so. I can't remember, but it's like I was able to understand these things that I had no idea about previously. And it's like, what? Let's just play this. Let's just do this. Mm-hmm. Take this. Like, well, strategically, I understand it. And, you know, but the benefit to me at that time was all these things that I would kind of complain about is like, why can't I hear all this new music? I would get now mm-hmm. before it was even considered new music. It was all these pre releases that never seen the light of day. And, I would collect them and I would be able to hear them and make that call as to what's going on here now. And just, and then also being able to understand the business aspect of it, you know, now having conversations with my friends and artists, that is a different skill set that took a while to develop, to be able to tell somebody, Oh, are you not paying our song? And for me to be like, well, is it really your best work right now or is that just your next work? You know, cause it's really tough to be able to say like, dude, your first single was amazing. This follow up. Do you have a third we could listen to, mm-hmm. you know, just kind of. Yeah. When you came on, you were doing promotions mm-hmm. and production mm-hmm. via Eddie L and John James. Yep. How did getting on the radio happen did you want to be on or somebody calling sick it was more of john james uh advocating for me oh yeah he really was a big supporter of me at that time and wanting me to be on the team in that capacity he wanted you for that station that's correct i cannot remember exactly how it went but it was just one day Fred Rico, who was the PD at the moment, was like, hey, uh, you're going to be on air this weekend. Make sure you don't mess up. Okay. I won't. I will do my best. <laughs> so, yeah, John will get you set up with tracking and all that. Okay. Cool. Thank, thank you. 
So <laughs> up to that point, had you been in the studio and looked at how the, I, the board was? Well, the production room had a board, so I was able to learn how it went without affecting anything mm -hmm. on air, which was much more comforting. Mm -hmm. But it was just, you know, just the, the mechanics of being able to... It's like when you get your driver's license, you know what you're doing, but when you're in the driver's seat in front of the instructor, like you're live, you're you're, you're in it now, mm -hmm. you start to act differently like, and question where, everything where, that's where happening. Where do I put it's my like, hands? It's like, and some of this may go over some of your heads, but it's like, am I in program one? That's in program one. No, I need to be in program two. Program one. Is program one? Did I check program one? Like consistently just absolute fear of accidentally being on air when you're not supposed to. Yeah. In the beginning, it was always voice track overnight. I think mm -hmm. it was one of those like 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. on mm -hmm. Saturday night or Sunday night oh, yeah, yeah, or yeah. something. You know, that's kind of where you start. Right. But yeah, that it, I did that for a little while. And it was just kind of just getting my getting my chops in, making the mistakes and learning and kind of understanding what my voice was that was the interesting one and even to this day i'm told that you know you, i don't sound anything like how i talk regularly but i'm like i feel like i do i i'm just more i already know what i'm about to say mm -hmm. and i say it louder and faster i think those are the three things that changes when i'm on air yeah unless i'm in the morning show then i get to talk like this which i absolutely love yeah I got really good at the, running the board, though, really quickly, which is kind of why they had me come in and do the morning show with um, Lanai and Augie, mm -hmm. which was kind of amazing because I was in high school listening to them. Were you their morning show producer? Yes. Okay. So I would run the board. So And that was the thing. Lanai used to run the board. Yeah. But when they brought me on board, they had me run the board for them just so that, be, I guess, not to toot my own horn, but I was good at it. Yeah. And it just frees up the people to, whoever the talent is, mm -hmm. to think about and listen to what they're saying. Right, instead of having, having to multitask. And yeah. I don't think people understand generally what that is about. And one shouldn't have to, you know, muddy It's kind of like cooking dinner butter. and talking on the phone at the same time. Oh, like when I go to Lily Hub Bakery and I'm sitting at the counter on Kuakini Street and usually the people who are taking my order are not the same people making my pancakes of the times I've gone. So it depends. Yeah, it does depend. Yeah. I do have one complaint about Lilia bakery. Um, the OG Lilia bakery is that I wish they would go back to playing, um, do out music in oh. their diner. That was my favorite thing about going to eat there is that you just hear all these oldies playing. Now they have like top 40 stuff, which is fine, but it's not, it doesn't give me that same nostalgic hmm. vibe. I wonder if the top 40 is actually that version of doo-wop now because it has been some time oh, since. Geez. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Nothing quite like someone saying that the music that I um, was raised up on in middle school and high school is now oldies for them. Understood. It just, yeah. It's just like... <sighs> There was is, that, one, is it just me? There was <laughs> one artist um, that I was helping to develop his set list. Yes. And I asked him, he's like, what kind of music do you see yourself singing when you're at home? Not like your original stuff, but I just want to get an idea of what you enjoy. It's like, nah, old school stuff, like, like the green. And I was like, boy, <laughs> you never just say the green right now <laughs> you really went there oh it was so funny and when it, did the green come out like i want to say it might have been like 2009 2011 that yeah. that realm fun fact um the first two gigs that the green has ever played i was their bass player and that was in at the King Kamehameha Hotel in Kona. It was the first one at a Catch a Fire concert. The oh, second one was in Maui with uh, Micah G and Kimie. How did you come um, on board to play bass? I'm not really sure what their reasoning was, but at that point already, I ha I was kind of established in the island music, Hawaiian reggae um, scene as somebody that you could call to, to fill in yeah. for anybody at like a moment's notice if you if you could in um 
include some of the artists over the seasons? I know that it's it's like a scroll, <laughs> you know, it's just like these people. But so artists that I've performed on stage with uh, include the Green Rebel Soldiers, Fiji. Oh man. I, I need to get my See, phone no, for this. I, I literally No, cannot... I, I think it's like a music festival. So Oh yeah. Yeah. So I've literally island, played yeah. a music festival where I did not get off stage from the beginning to the end. Yeah. That was fun. If somebody were to ask me like about the groups I've seen live, you know, I, I wish I had kept a list. But for you, you've actually played with bands that people are like learning how to either sing their music or learning the instrumentation yep. because there are bands that I grew up listening to that I now play with currently. Like, okay. What is that like? Okay. Wait, but uh, okay. So, okay. <laughs> so Fiji was like one of the biggest ones where I'm like, this is crazy. And yeah. he took me to Fiji and to Australia to play with him. And yeah. Skin. It was crazy. Yeah. And just being there with him, he's like basically the prime minister of Fiji. Mm -hmm. They call him George, right? Mm. It's some kind of reassurance as a musician is like, man, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm putting in the work that I need to put in. And mm. that was amazing because he's, in my opinion, a living legend in this particular um, community. And he's still got his voice. <sighs> uh, it's still, you know, I, I wish him and send him all the better health, you know, mm. in all aspects, though. But anytime he opens his mouth, I'm like. Amazing. Um, another band that I, the next band I think I played with was Big Every Time, BET. Mm. Um, right now I'm actually managing and playing with Natural Vibrations. But yeah, exactly. It's all these groups that I literally grew up listening to when I was in high school to the radio stations that I was working at very intensely. And like, I could have never seen this happening when I was young, but it's just like, you just think about it, it's like, oh, I would love to do this. I would love to do this. And it just kind of all music is basically everything that I do. Mm -hmm. And you think and I think about it all the time is where a lot of people that is their outlet to what their regular life is. Mm -hmm. I just get to have that all the time. Before you get into your list of bands that you oh, yeah, performed with live. Yeah. And I'm sure that there's probably another list of where you've provided like studio music for their recordings oh yeah yeah it was only recently 2019 i actually made music my full like specifically playing music anything related to music my full-time like thing that's mm -hmm. how i make a living before that and even now i guess to a certain extent is i just see it as something that i don't want it to have the pressures of of having to be responsible for my well-being mm. you know it's like something that you love so much that I would never want it to suffer because it has this negative connotation of like, I have to do this to make money. Mm -hmm. So it took a long time for me to really make it my primary source of income. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't the driving force of it. You were just like, I get to play live and I'm getting, not so you get to a point that's not being paid, but you're earning, you're earning money. It was like the, the, the shift of yeah, getting paid. It's, it's what yeah. you would call the side hustle, right? Yeah. And it was always great because I would get this, which provided me my health benefits and my, mm -hmm. and would pay for my bills. And then I would have this, which, you know, would allow me to do whatever I want, mm -hmm. you know? And it wasn't like anything extravagant, but it was comfortable. Mm -hmm. And it was nice that that's, the relationship that I had with that income was that this is I get to play and I have money to play with mm -hmm. versus I get to play and all of this money has to be accounted for to take care of this. Yeah. And, I, and like I said, I made that transition in 2019 because I kind of looked at it and I realized that the opportunities that I have and the position that uh, um, I've put myself in mm -hmm. in this community would allow me to do that without having to really worry that it would become this love hate relationship you know recently created a priority system in my being and and realized that you know as much as i want to help everybody cuz that's essentially what it comes down to from my from my perspective is like 
I want to help my friends. I want to play with my friends as much as I can. And that's what they've become throughout the years. You know, it's like you learn, you know, who these people are and, and everything about them and their families. And you see their families growing and you're at their, their personal events and you become very tied in with these people. I want to continue doing that. I have fun being around these people, these people or this person. And I just want them to succeed. And I, I would like to be a part of that. And that's the way that I see like music just being in the scene as a whole. Like I'm so thankful that I get to be a part of it in this way. Not really thinking about well, when you reflect, you start to see things that you're not really seeing. But in, in this moment right now, mm-hmm. when I'm talking to you or somebody about music, it's like, OK, what is what is our plan? What are we going to do? Let's do something fun. Let's get it. Let's, let's jam. You want you want to do a show? Let's do a show. Mm-hmm. And it's like that, you know. And it, and it's not really about. Oh no! I want to want to hear oh, the list. Yeah, I, I, well, actually, in the, the I uh, forgot why <laughs> I was why I was holding it. <laughs> I was like, why am I holding my phone? <laughs> I got it. My alarm's gonna be going off pretty soon. Um, but I do want to hear that um, that list if you feel comfortable. No, that's going fine. It. So then Fiji is I I got a chance to be on the road with Fiji, Irie Love, Rebel Soldiers, Maoli, Josh Tofi, The Green, um, Micah G. I've worked with groups like Morgan Heritage on some tracks through radio. I've built a pretty good relationship with like other artists, like mm-hmm. like international artists. It's just super cool. Whenever certain artists come in, mm-hmm. I've somehow become like, you know, really close to them as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Become the guys like, hey, can you put together a band for these shows that I have coming up? Shoots. I just realized that all the bands that you play with, they have their original music and mm-hmm. they also have songs that they may cover and sometimes yep. there may be an occasion where they have a special guest whatever city or festival lineup so there may be all these other um bag of tricks that anybody could be calling for a song how is it these days are do the artists management give you a spotify list and say oh these are the songs just be familiar with uh these 120 songs because we could mix it i mean i i don't know they typically provide a set list yeah um some of them just provide youtube links some mm. of them provide nothing at all yeah um some of them like myself mm-hmm. provide everything i will provide the set list the, the keys, actual music yeah the original recordings the live arrangement recordings wow and it's all in the dropbox always ready to go that's just because i do that for myself yeah Everybody has a different standard to how they conduct business. Yeah, I mean, I guess not a lot. Well, sometimes singers are singers, and that's all that they do. So they don't understand the the things that, how we prepare for shows. They know how they prepare for it. Yeah, exactly. Do most people have, I mean, now as um, things have been opening up after pandemic, have it has it gotten better or have people been more relaxed and like you figure it out? I don't know what other people are doing oh, now. Okay. Only because most of the people that I now work with, I'm the guy. Oh, yeah. When when I send something in this specific way, mm-hmm. that other people would take note and be able to do the same thing moving forward if they're ever in that position mm-hmm. or even mentioning it to somebody else. But I'm not sure. Is I guess I, I've just been kind of in my own lane, just doing what I do mm-hmm, for mm-hmm. such a long time now. There was a point where I was always around, always in the scene, just always out getting to know people and just being around. And that's how I would pick up gigs. And that's how I would learn how different people would, mm-hmm. you know, provide their music and stuff. Now that it's been so long and I've created all these relationships. But yeah, you wouldn't learn 120 songs going back to what you were saying. Um, usually it's about 60 to 90 minutes, which turns out to be. Uh, maybe around 15 to 20 songs. Less if there's commercials. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you. Right, right. We have different things to do to stretch out time, but uh, that's, <laughs> I've played, I've literally played a one hour set that consisted of four hour, four songs before. Were you playing with fish? Was <laughs> it, it was, the Grateful Dead? <laughs> it, it was, it was, it was interesting, but it was fun. Mm-hmm. It then becomes um, you're relying on different skill sets mm-hmm. instead of just music, sing, next song. It now becomes how do I interact? Oh, how do I showcase the in, the instruments? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do I? Um, oh, that's wonderful. That 
that they do that. Well, I think it's great. I've gone to enough shows where I'm so familiar with um, certain songs that, and again, it's just for me, I like a different arrangement. If mm. it's a little bit more upbeat or down tempo. But then, of course, not everybody does because there are like newer fans who right. are just like, it's not like how it is right. in the record. Or, so or excuse is- me, on the... <laughs> the digital exchange library. That's blah, not blah, how blah. I heard it streaming. <laughs> yeah. That's a good uh, point of view because a lot of bands or a lot of different um, groups nowadays, they don't particularly have someone to call their music director. Mm-hmm. That that comes at a very, um, I think it's a very high standard that you would have to uphold to be able to be called that mm-hmm. because you're ultimately making the decisions on how they sound. Mm-hmm. right? And only in the last maybe like five years I've been assuming that name. I've been doing that job for a long time, but I, I wasn't comfortable being called that, I guess. Yeah. So in this moment with one of the groups that I'm the music director for, I have these exact discussions with them Mm -hmm. about, you know, as you are your own group and you have established your name, throughout Hawaii and internationally, what I have noticed is that some of your interpretations of your songs have become just that rather than what people know on the album. Mm -hmm. It's like whether the tempos are like too fast or it's sung a different way Mm -hmm. or it's arranged in such a cool way that you are no longer in the realm of what that song was originally. Mm -hmm. And it may be cool, but at the same time, you're doing artist things when we should be doing business things. Mm. If you weren't doing music, do you think you would have gone, or maybe you are going into like videography because you have so much behind the scenes stuff from playing. Do you have like, do you bring out your camera and, have you been documenting? I have not really been. I I tried to do it while I while I'm part of the band, but it to me it's too much work mm. to handle in that capacity to achieve the level of production that I'd like to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So right now I actively hire out other guys to do it. Mm-hmm. I have been doing videography pretty heavily since the pandemic. Well, before that, but even more so since the pandemic. But I think that for me, for a lot of the things that I do, I like to, first off, cost savings is what kind of caused me to learn a lot of things, how to make flyers, do graphic design, edit videos. And editing video was kind of easier because of the audio editing experience I've had in the past. Mm -hmm. When you go into cameras, now you're looking at aperture uh, f-stops. I mean, well, aperture f-stops. Uh, the ISOs and the shutter mm-hmm. speeds and the and the color correction and S log versus F log versus RAW versus Apple ProRes and, and all these things. Let's not even talk about DSLR versus mirrorless cameras. Right, full frame <laughs> APS-C sensors, all of these things. And for me, the reason why I learn how to do all these mm-hmm. things is the first one is because it interests me. Mm-hmm. Second, it saves me money to do it myself. But the third thing that I really realize is the biggest reason why I have built these skill sets mm-hmm. is so that I can articulate to those who have the time to do it what my expectations are. Because if I'm saying it's like, oh, I just want it to look cool, that does nothing for me. But now I'm able to say it's like, I want it to look like this, possibly more warm Mm -hmm. with slower edits because I want this feel and I can help to set these things up versus just being like, you know, I don't really know how to say it, but I kind of want it to look like this Mm -hmm. and this put together, but not this part of it. You know, that whole thing of just being creative, it's difficult. So I, I, I feel like that's the big benefit of being able to learn um, about these things and just grow and learn. That's the best part about the Internet, YouTube, the best thing ever. Circling back to um, the Apple Genius Bar. So Apple, I have nothing but good things to say about them. They're a great company. They took care of me. 
like pay is great. Um, the envi- work in my environment is great. They care about you as a person, period. That's the amazing thing. So they set you up with these skill sets that help you to be a better person, period, not a better worker. Anybody can be a good worker, but a terrible person. Mm. And that's the thing that I really like about it. They'll legitimately just be like, you um, should focus on your ability to communicate with superiors. Focus on that this week and see how you can grow in that particular thing. And of course, it benefits them. But at the same time, I think about it and how I communicate with those who may be in positions of power and different things that I do. Clients that I'm working with who have um, the expectation to be spoken to a certain way, I can understand that dynamic rather than being just, you know, missing the mark, so to speak. Right. And that's just a small example. But all these little things that they teach you to be able to just improve yourself as a person and just like being being able to listen and and communicate and be patient with with others empathy is a big thing over there um i'm actually moving studios um this month or Mm. next month december to um set up like a a more controlled environment Mm -hmm. similar to this one where you have control over everything Mm -hmm. versus me going um the concept of my podcast that i was trying to do during the pandemic was to just be mobile and go there and be in their environment and talk stories with my friends in their Mm -hmm. most comfortable spots uh being a one-man production it wasn't was a lot of work yes exactly it was a lot of work to do and some of them came out great Mm. um others i had issues with like the the quality control and i wasn't happy with all of the, all of the audio is great with any form of uh, content creation the content itself is the most important thing mm-hmm. regardless of the quality of the video the quality of the audio think about this yeah. if you had a recording of your grandparents singing a song together Aww. you don't care what it sounds like yeah. because it's them it's the yeah. content that is the most meaningful to you mm-hmm. and that's why i'm a huge advocate which it's terrible because i i cannot operate off of my own advice but <laughs> i'm a huge advocate of just do it i don't yeah. care what you have just do it yeah but at the same time i'm like oh i've already been creating this quality content mm-hmm. in this particular market mm-hmm. for so long that i don't think that i have I could go backwards in that step. I found a video of a friend's band playing, and it's shaky as all get out because it was on my iPhone, and I thought maybe I could just put it in my um, editing software and, like, stabilize it. Right. So I'm like, let it process rendering, and I'm playing it back, and I'm like, nope. (laughs) (laughs) Even the audio, I'm just like, nope, nope. But it's one of those things, like, Maybe they'd appreciate it, but at the same time, it's just like it, you know, where, where to draw the line. Right, you know? but that, that's Maybe the one where you years. send it directly to yeah. them or yeah, yeah, depending on the, the timing too, right? Yeah. Because some things aren't just ready to be revealed yet. Mm-hmm. Like I have some stuff that um, I forgot that I had that I came across with. I'll share it with you. I did sound for my friend's wedding. Mm. And her new husband played and sang a song to her. And of of course, people videoed it, but they don't know that I multi-tracked that performance. So I have the guitar and the vocals separate and I can make it sound real nice. And I was thinking about sending it to them like in that moment. But I was like, I put it off and I forgot about it Mm -hmm. because in my, my head, I was like, oh, I'll do it later. And then when I remembered about it, I was like, you know what? I'll hold on to it. Whenever I see you. You seem just very, like, just even. I, and that's kind of the core of your personality. You, mm-hmm. you know, you have your understanding of what your north is. You know your priorities and purpose. And that's just remained consistent since I've known you. I, this is what I've observed, you know. <laughs> yeah. This is my opinion. Naturally, innately, that's how you were raised up to, like, no hurries, no worries. It'll get done. I feel that the way that my parents operate is very different from me. The biggest thing of why I left Apple was not only because I felt like it was my time to dedicate my life to music primarily, Mm -hmm. but also because I wanted to have complete control over my time. 
And that was the most difficult thing about working for them, but not particularly them, but having a job in general. Like my job here at mm-hmm. the radio station, I was very clear about what it is that my expectations were and we were able to work that out. And I have a really great relationship with our company here that I'm able to accommodate my music and do this at the same time. Mm-hmm. A lot of times you'll hear me recording from hotel rooms, in random places on the mainland or in New Zealand or wherever it may be, which is great because, shoot, I get to be here and there. But with Apple, you have to be there. Mm-hmm. With any other normal job, you have to be there. Mm-hmm. The biggest thing was that I was leveraging all of my vacation time and all of my time off to be able to accommodate music in itself. Stepping away from that, which was a great place to be, and I would love to be there again in some sort of capacity, was to make time to be with my family. So outside of playing music, you will normally find me at like maybe like the Big Island with my family. We're just doing whatever I want, really. (laughs) 